Israelites. This is the podcast for the Yale Forum on Religion and Ecology. And this week, I'm really happy to welcome onto the show, Joshua Duclo. Josh, thanks for making time for us. I'm very happy to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, yeah, really looking forward to uh, chatting with you. Um, and a little brief bio to help orient people. Uh, you're an instructor of humanities and philosophy at St. Paul's School uh, in New Hampshire. And you focus a lot on moral philosophy, value theory, uh, specifically as it pertains to environmental issues. And uh, a lot of this kind of thinking has uh, come together in uh, a book that came out about a year ago, uh, last year, 2022, uh, Wilderness Morality and Value. I've got my copy here. And uh, a lovely book. It's uh, you know relatively thin, uh, considering that there's a tremendous amount of information and really good arguments uh, put in there. So I'm really excited to chat with you about that. And uh, but first, I always like hearing how people get into the world of environmental philosophy or, you know, because a lot of times when people think about wilderness or the environment, it's just science, maybe policy, uh, but philosophical stuff, spiritual, religious stuff that's often seen as a separate domain. Uh, so curious how you how you found your way into this world. Yeah, I mean, you, you put your finger right on it. I mean, the other thing that's often associated with the topic is is activism. Right. And certainly science is important. It's it's vital. Um, the politics of it is important. Activism is important. And so I in no way want to dismiss any of those parts. But I, I am a philosopher. I did my PhD in philosophy. And it started to frustrate me that a lot of the literature, even the literature that was that was kind of uh, had had aspirations to be philosophical was really more oriented towards science or towards policy and towards towards activism. And, and it felt like there was um, an opportunity and maybe a need to do some gritty philosophical work on, on some of these topics. So um, how how I got into it, um, I mean, like I said, I was I was doing a PhD in philosophy, but my interest had been more in, in contemporary 20th century moral philosophy. <laughs> analytic philosophy, um, virtue theory, neo-Aristotelianism, things things like that. But during during graduate school, I worked part-time for a, a guiding company, a sort of international outdoor adventure travel uh, company that was based in New York City. But I, I was one of their guides for the Northeast of the US. So on weekends and holidays, I would meet clients from New York and, and go on you know, wilderness adventures, <laughs> um, so to speak, and 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 different trips, and then uh, got into doing some international stuff with them. Well, some some stuff on the West Coast and the Rockies and the in the Cascades, some stuff in Europe, and um, a decent amount of work in in Nepal as mm -hmm. well. And uh, there, there's a lot of um, sort of off the cuff philosophizing that happens out on out on the trail. Um, right. You got you got time on your hands. You don't have service on your phone, and and people like to like to wax philosophical. Hmm. Um, and often, when when clients or people I'd meet would find out that I had a background in philosophy or that I was doing doing graduate work in philosophy, they they push me for some of my philosophical views on the environment. And in many cases, I was embarrassed to say that I just didn't really have coherent <laughs> views on on uh, on many of these topics. You know, that I'd give the old response like, well, that's complicated or, <laughs> well, you know, there's there's so much literature on that topic and that's that's right. not really where I work. And, you know, none of that was satisfying. Um, and before I had to look at literature, um, uh, I, I felt dissatisfied with some of it. Not, not that it, there wasn't really good stuff out there, but some of the questions I had about wilderness, I, I didn't feel... Um, we're answering the questions I was asking myself. Mm -hmm. So that's that's where the project came from uh, initially. And I really did want to try to write something that that bracketed some of the political and more uh, activist oriented questions, um, which is to say, I didn't I didn't want to write a book just as an environmentalist. And I'm not right. criticizing people who do, and I'm not you know slighting that work in any way. Um, but I think I think bad philosophy comes out in the wash. And when you build either a political platform or an activist platform, and the the undergirding metaphysics or epistemology or ethics is is shoddy, um, it's going to come around to get you. Um, so I, I wanted to bracket some of my own sort of environmental inclinations and and just go back to 
some first principles, I guess. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that's, yeah, that's where it started. I appreciate that a lot because it is, uh, you know, so often people are in such a hurry to get the the kind of activist result they're looking for or the political result. And they're just like, okay, well, we should do this and this. And you're like, well, hold on, let's think about the principles that we're actually operating on here and uh, maybe clarify that and do that kind of work. And then once we have that a little more stable, then we can start thinking more about our political agendas and our activist work and that kind of thing. So, yeah, I appreciate that a lot about the book. You really do survey a lot of the issues. Uh, without necessarily pushing an agenda and that that could be that could be hard to do especially in times when obviously there's so serious environmental crisis that you just want to get to the action already you're like hold on we need to we need yeah. to think and uh, and that's what philosophy is at its best is like hold on it's a good idea to think about this right um, right and you've got you've got a you've got to acid test the ideas um I, I think as i admit somewhere in in the book like almost everyone else who writes on this topic I'm someone who loves wilderness or nature, however you want to understand it. I would like to see it preserved. I'd like to see more of it preserved. Um, and it would be lovely if I if I could uh, if I thought it was philosophically tenable to just ascribe some kind of of rock solid intrinsic value uh, to all of the things I want to protect and make some apodictic argument such that no one could ever reasonably infringe upon these things, but. I don't think the arguments break down that way. And so it's it, it actually seems like a better long-term strategy to me to be honest um, and, and sort of fair about the moral reasoning and then see how to work with what we've actually got. Yeah. Yeah, well said. And it's, you know, sometimes you just hear people say, well, we should just love nature and things like that. And you're like, okay, but there's all kinds of conflicting issues and values that are involved with that. And so we, we need to get yeah. specific. We need to think through this kind of stuff, especially, you know, as, as your book points out in the Anthropocene, the, the very concept of wilderness has kind of broken down in a certain sense. And like, well, there's really no pure wilderness left because we've mm -hmm. had, there's a human footprint everywhere, you know, we've changed the chemistry of the atmosphere. And so then thinking through wilderness that becomes pretty complicated. Absolutely. I mean, it's, Wilderness is going to be a choice uh, at this point, to the extent that there will be anything that could be reasonably described as wilderness in 100 years, 200 years, whatever you want to say, that's going to be a choice. And once, once a situation becomes a choice like that, a choice based on policy and human desire, um, you got to think very, very carefully about the reasons backing choices one way uh, or, or the other. So yeah, I, I do think the technological and scientific reality of the Anthropocene has created the need for sort of new philosophical analyses yeah. that, that frankly may not have been necessary 50 years ago or, or 100 years ago. I do think philosophy has to respond to the times. Um, I, I just wanted to add one other thing. You, you made me um, remember something, you know, when, when people say things like, well, why can't we all just love nature? Doesn't everybody love nature? And, it, there were there were a handful of comments in in you know serious peer reviewed articles that I was looking at that just drove me crazy. Where where people would sort of end arguments by saying, it is um, you know it is self evident that people prefer a view of the Grand Canyon to a view of the Manhattan skyline, and like mm -hmm. that that was used as a serious argument for why nature is valuable. And I was just thinking, wow. what people are you talking to? Like <laughs> I, I happen to think the Grand Canyon is a more impressive view. <laughs> Than the Manhattan skyline, but I promise you, I could I could fill a stadium with people who feel differently, yeah, and who would look at you and go, "You want to go spend your vacation in the desert, <laughs> you know, with with coyotes? Like, what what are you talking about?" And there was this this other line someone used um, that that really stuck with me, and it was at the point in a, in an in an article when someone really should have been giving an an argument for the value of nature or wilderness or or um, you know, the non-human natural world. And they just said, they wrote something like, um, I don't even need to argue for this because anyone who doesn't think that nature is intrinsically valuable has a deranged value system. And they're not <laughs> worth talking to. Wow. And I thought, well, isn't that convenient for you? <laughs> you know, someone who disagrees with you, well, they're deranged and therefore we just don't even have to talk to them. Like, it's all a little too convenient when you start, when you start making those arguments. And I, I know too many smart, virtuous people who have very little interest in nature and very little regard 
for its value. And I, I do think they're missing something quite crucial, but I don't think they have deranged value systems. And, and if I feel differently, it's uh, the burden's kind of on me to, to present an argument of some kind. Yeah, right. Deranged is a strong claim. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So those those were the sort of things that irked me in the in the literature. And those are, you know, I'm cherry picking a couple examples, but um, these were prominent, prominent authors and prominent pieces. Yeah, which can be good for when like minded people read that they can get all excited. But you're like, I'm not sure if this is going to be a solid foundation for ethics and policy. And, you know, we, right. we need to maybe clarify that. Right. Instead of just right. name calling. And it's a good point about the Manhattan skyline. Yeah, there's a lot of people that can be like, I'm not going to go to, why would I go to the Grand Canyon and stare into a large hole? Right. What is, what is <laughs> yeah. the point of that? Look at the exactly. amazing skyline here and all the culture. So much is happening. Uh, right, right. So yeah, it's good to really honor that diversity of, of human opinion and yeah. really get, get down to it. And like, what are we talking about? And even, you know, you mentioned intrinsic value. Like these are, you know, fundamental questions, intrinsic value, instrumental value, anthropocentrism, non-anthropocentrism. And uh, the book does a really good job of hashing that stuff out in a way that, you know, the 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 really the old guard of wilderness writing uh, wasn't addressing your Henry David Thoreau, Wallace Stegner, John Muir. It, the issues weren't as complicated in those times as they are now, uh, post-World War II, Anthropocene, 21st century. Uh, it's really become quite a mess. And, and, you know, one of the things I really appreciate, too, is that you're showing that uh, concern for wilderness has some conflicts in it because there's wilderness, but there's also the animals in the wilderness. And caring yeah. for one and caring for the other doesn't necessarily line up. Uh, and so wilderness, uh, conservation, animal rights, animal welfare, these aren't all on the same team. So I wonder if you could speak to that, because it's a big part of the, of the book is addressing uh, some of these kind of conflicts. Yeah, I, I got to give enormous credit here to a philosopher named Mark Segoff, who in, in the 1980s wrote an article called, so, so I might be getting this slightly wrong, but Environmental Ethics and Animal Liberation, Bad Marriage, Quick Divorce. Right. And he didn't have an axe to grind in the article. What he did was really beautifully draw out that two movements tended to treat each other as allies. And if they were all working for the same thing, the environmental movement and the animal liberation or the animal rights movement. But when you get right down to it, there's, there's a perhaps intractable conflict there um, for the simple reason that with the exception of the worst forms of factory farming, there is no place where animal welfare is more endangered, where, where there is less animal welfare than, than in the wilderness. Right. Um, you know, I'm uh, to, to quote Sagoff here, uh, fr Frank, uh, Mother Nature is so cruel to her children that she makes Frank Perdue look like a saint. Um, <laughs> and you know, to me, this is, this is not a philosophical argument. This is just a fact. Biologists, zoologists have known this for a very long time. Darwin struggled with this mightily. I mean, when he really, got into nature and started looking at the mechanisms of natural selection, the unremittent suffering and cruelty um, shook him to his core to the point that it, it, it moved him away from anything like Christian theism. Um, and he verged on atheism and settled into a really unhappy agnosticism. But it was just, it was the problem of natural evil, the, the amount of suffering and just endless pain and uh, early death and parasitism and starvation and predation uh, that exists in the natural world. So if you're someone who's, who's sort of morally motivated by animal liberation or animal welfare or animal rights, you'd need to ask yourself, why, why would animal suffering matter only if the suffering is anthropogenic, mm -hmm. which is to say only if the suffering has derived from human beings. I mean, right. you might think that suffering is bad as well, but if you're concerned about the welfare of, of animals, the vast, vast majority of badness that, that happens to non-human creatures happens naturally or, or is, is, is wild suffering. Um, so Segov was absolutely right to point that out. He didn't, he didn't really go further with that or do much with it. It was just saying, look, we need to notice this. And um, at a certain point, the political agendas of conservation and environmentalism might run head on into the political and activist 
agendas of, of animal welfare thinkers. And that has started to happen. And it gets more intense and, and um, timely as scientific and technological advancements go on. So now you have very serious, uh, prominent, successful moral philosophers um, who, who argue for things like germline genetic modification of predators such that we can slowly transition them into being herbivores. And that if you're someone who cares about animal welfare, we need to start to think about how to do this in a way that is not environmentally disastrous, where we don't have this um, you know, massive disruption of the of the web of life and and all that. A, a more a more modest uh suggestion is is the um the, the perennial debate about um hunting and and or using um sterilization to control deer populations um you know are you are you really standing up for animal welfare if you uh, allow these boom and bust cycles of of starvation um such that environments are are hosting uh prey populations that they cannot possibly sustain right. yeah that's that's a good one and just uh reminds me of um the latest book from martha nussbaum uh justice for animals yeah. where she comes out and says predators we need to stop that and yeah. uh, and they're like wow but then yeah. the prey populations yeah. are going to explode yeah and she's like well birth control for the prey populations and yeah. that's like that's a crazy level of intervention that then you know Absolutely. conservationists are going to be like that's we should back off on that how are you going to manage populations so much that's Absolutely. just an incredible amount of intervention yeah i think this mom's book uh, links letter than mine, uh, but you know it's 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 good. It's good that she wrote that. <laughs> um, yeah, this can be a difficult conversation sometimes to to have with people coming at it from the world of conservation or biology or or policy because these really are distinct issues. And and someone can make a philosophical argument, and you it's really not appropriate to respond to a philosophical argument with a practical biological problem or a practical political problem. So I, I completely agree. And as I, I really try to make it very clear in the book, at the current moment, anyone who cares about wilderness and frankly cares about the welfare of wild animals, the best thing we can do is nothing. <laughs> leave, leave it alone, get our hands off. Most of our in interventions to date have uh, just made things worse. Yeah. But that in no way um, suggests that in principle, there is not human activity or human intervention that could be um, that could be undertaken for the benefit of, of non-human animals. Um, this, this is usually how, how um, the precautionary principle tends to get Im Im employed, that people, um, humans have a long history of screwing things up because we think we know more than we do and we get involved and then we go, man, we really shouldn't have gotten involved there. <laughs> okay, like fair, fair enough, I, I take that point. But to me, that's an argument to proceed with caution. So, um, I mean, I think medical science is just a, is, is a great example of this. Um, in, in the early days of, of medicine, let's say up, up until the late 19th century, frankly, the best thing that any physician ever could have done for their patient was to get away from them <laughs> as quickly as possible. Get your dirty, grubby fingers out of the <laughs> out of their wounds. Stop breathing on them. Um, stop thinking that you can operate without anesthesia. Um, stop thinking that bleeding them, you know, is, is going to cure them. Um, <laughs> but, but what you wouldn't want to do is then derive some sort of timeless principle from that. So. Um, George Washington was actually killed by his physicians. He was bled to death. Oh. Um, and, you know, so if you would, if you take, took, just took that example and said, look, humans just don't know enough about the body or human biology. When someone's sick, just leave them alone. Like there's as good a chance that they're going to get better if we just do nothing. And if we intervene, we're just going to make things worse. But prescriptions like that only apply to the, the current state of knowledge and technology that, that a field has. So it would be very strange if now that may have been true in 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 the late 1700s. You know, I, I actually think if if I time traveled back then and I got sick, I wouldn't let a physician near me. 
But if I come down with some kind of um, bacterial infection today, the first thing I'm going to do is get myself over to a clinic or a hospital because our knowledge of human physiology and biology and, and chemistry and the germ theory of disease and antibiotics is so far advanced. There's, there's really no reason to think, especially with a, um, a, a field of knowledge as young as environmental science and the, and the science of ecology, that, which is still in its infancy, that as we continue to make incremental and very likely exponential growth in our, in our understanding of how these systems work, that we will also get these exponential, uh, we'll get exponential growth in our ability to make precise and, and fruitful interventions in systems in ways that will allow us to achieve certain goals without disastrous side effects. Um, I mean, to me, that's, that's just the history of, of science and technology. And it's, it's hard to see because we're so good at screwing up the environment, but I am, I'm as confident as I could be in anything um, that we will, we will become very, very good at manipulating environments. I mean, we, we already are to, to some extent. That's true. Even if you just look at the last century, uh, the yeah, ecological knowledge and uh, yeah, our ability to intervene in, in safer and more beneficial ways is so different and so much more yeah. improved. Yeah. To remove certain species, introduce certain species, um, you know, what, what, what sort of um, periodic burns are useful, what sort of periodic burns are disastrous. And, and you know, it's going to take a while to acquire that knowledge. So I don't know when, I don't know at what point we would have sufficient ecological knowledge that we would be confident in something like germline genetic modification to eliminate predation. I have no, I have no idea if, if that's on the horizon. But let's assume that we will get to the point where we could do it without some ecological disaster. Then we're back to the philosophical and the moral question, which is, should we do that? Right. What's gained? What's lost? What rights are involved? Um, how do you start thinking about that welfare? But I, I think it's a real think it's a real red herring to get sidetracked on um, on the scientific or the technological questions. Yeah, no, that's a great point. Uh, yeah, to just imagine, okay, let's say the science was there, let's say the technology was there, then let's talk about that philosophical question, which still remains, yeah. is it okay to have this kind of like paternalistic relationship to nature, yeah. where yeah. we decide who should be predator, who should be prey, what everybody should be eating, and then we intervene and make sure that it happens. And people would say, well, that's clearly too anthropocentric. These are all our ideas. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, uh, non-anthropocentrism has some problems too, being centered on life, being centered on ecosystems. You know, that's the classic kind of thing in environmental ethics is the centrisms, anthropocentric, yeah. biocentric, ecocentric. Uh, and so I know, you know, uh, you like a lot of these issues in your book, you kind of put a really fresh spin on some of these things and you kind of come out saying, well, in a way, caring about wilderness is anthropocentric and you know if you have those people reading john muir or something you're like no it's wilderness has intrinsic value on its own it's not us uh so i wonder if you get into that a little bit it's such a such a key issue yeah and and this is um this is where i think philosophy kind of um er earns its keep is i think i think philosophy is good at at unpacking these topics and and careful analytic ways. Not, not that analytic philosophy has the answers to everything, but I'm not sure it has the answers to anything, <laughs> but but it's it's really powerful, I, I think, in situations like this. So we want to say something like, look, uh, the wilderness has intrinsic value and just go spend a weekend in the Sierras and you too will understand that. Well, one, I question that. I know a lot of people who spend weekends in the Sierras and they just come away <laughs> thinking, oh, next week I'm going to Vegas, like I'm done with that crap. Um, <laughs> But but even still, okay. So what do we mean by by intrinsic value? Um, and I I try to break it down in four ways. That's not exhaustive. There are there are plenty of other sort of value theorists who who, who could find other ways. But at a minimum, there's there's four ways to to understand what might be meant by the statement wilderness has intrinsic value. Um, so on the one hand, it's just contrasted to instrumental value where you know, you know money being the paradigmatic example um unless someone has a fetish for currency no, nobody thinks nobody thinks that a hundred dollar bill itself has value it's valuable in that it's instrumental in getting you to something else 
And if you enjoy that thing for what it is, then that thing has instrumental, uh, ha has intrinsic value. Um, I think everyone wants to admit that wilderness and nature has instrumental value, certainly, but the question is, does it have intrinsic? All right, but then, then so what's meant by that? One thing that people could mean is um, ultimate value, mm -hmm. where it's just the last bit of value in that chain, right? I like A because A gets me B, B gets me C, C gets me D, and the ultimate value is wherever that stops and you say, no, 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 I just enjoy this. I just find this valuable for what it is. I'm not using it to get anything else. Um, okay, uh, so that's that's one way. Another way that intrinsic value gets used is synonymous with the idea of moral considerability, such that if something has intrinsic value, that thing has independent moral value and is deserving of independent um, moral consideration. Right. So, um, you know, we, we, we've just met. And so it, um, I, I don't know, it'd be weird for me to say that you contain ultimate value for me. Like maybe, maybe we're just involved in an instrumental relationship, uh, right now, but I'm completely comfortable, um, that you as a, as a human person, you have intrinsic value in the sense of, of moral considerability such that I'm not free to treat you merely as an object, uh, that when I engage in moral deliberation, if my actions are going to affect you, I need to take, um, I need to take your, your desires, rights, and hopes, um, uh, and, and pains and pleasures um, into my thinking. Yeah. Okay. Um, another, another way intrinsic value gets used is in a sort of peculiar, more in sense of from more of knowledge value for something to possess intrinsic value uh the value it has must must be understood with reference only to the properties of that thing itself and not in relation to any other thing and then the the last one and this this to me has always seemed like the holy grail of environmentalists and conservationists is um, intrinsic value as the idea of value in the absence of valuers. A thing just absolutely is valuable. It doesn't matter if anyone does value it. If any, it doesn't matter if anyone ever will value it. It simply possesses this magical property um, known as value, and therefore it's inviolable. And if if there was some way. And the reason I think environmentalists, going back but back to the Rutleys, have been so interested in this is that if there was ever a way to ascribe that kind of intrinsic value to the sorts of things environmentalists want to protect, then it's 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 almost like a silver bullet. Like you got it. There's no arguments that can be given. Um, we're not going to involve ourselves in utilitarian calculations or or trading of rights. It just is valuable. Um, for, for for a number of reasons, um, I don't think Moore's conception of intrinsic value could possibly be ascribed to wilderness. Value in the absence of valuers, I think, is uh, um, incoherent. Um, and then the idea of moral considerability. Could the wilderness itself be a moral agent or, or even a moral patient such that we have those responsibilities? And I think that's a, a, a weird sort of anthropomorphism. I think it's creating agency out of, out of something that just doesn't have it. Um, so in, in the book, I, I guess I do end up defending sort of a sentientist line. Um, and for me, wilderness is an idea. It's, it's really not an entity. It's a, it's a condition of the natural world distinguished by a, a relative absence of human activity. And I don't know how you ascribe moral status to a condition of the natural world absent human activity. Um, now, I do think component parts of the wilderness themselves have, have moral considerability, and that needs to be taken very seriously. But so, so where I end up with in, in thinking that, that the, the value of wilderness itself, wilderness qua wilderness, um, if it has intrinsic value, it's going to be ultimate value. Um, in, in the sense that there is some value that human beings derive from wilderness that is not replicable and it's not reducible to a value that can be acquired in, in other ways. Um, now, I don't, I don't know what implications necessarily that will have for the environmental movement or conservation, 
but I, but I think it's philosophically sound. And I think, um, yeah, understanding if we're making arguments about uh, what should or shouldn't happen to wilderness, understanding what the value of wilderness is seems fundamental. Yeah, no, that's great. Uh, and uh, yeah, really clear on such a complicated issue. And really, I got to say, that's um, that's the way the whole book reads. The the clarity of the argumentation is great. I really appreciate it because um, it's it's hard to hash that stuff out. And the literature is is kind of such a tangled mess of different people using these terms in slightly different ways. Uh, so I really appreciate the way you kind of clarify that. And uh, and yeah, it, it makes me wonder what would be the implications? You're like, all right, that's going to be, that's another book to deal with that. Uh, but for now, just hashing that yeah. out is so helpful. And it just, uh, you know, terms like wilderness mean so much to people, it has such a cultural resonance that we forget to actually kind of distinguish what we're talking about. Um, so really, really helpful to clarify that. And the difference that, you know, the component parts of wilderness are one thing, talking about certain uh, species or certain landscapes, you know, mountains or rivers, uh, that that's one thing, but then just wilderness in general or in the singular, that gets pretty nebulous. Yeah, and that was that was the first sort of um, academic puzzle that I noticed when I when I got into this project is that th there's been a 30 year long meta debate about the term wilderness, yeah. um, which is important and fruitful. And there's been a lot of good stuff that have come out of it, but it's it's difficult on the one hand to, to feel like we can have reasonable engagements about political and moral decisions being made about the future of wilderness or wilderness areas um, when we can even agree on whether it's a empty referent, you know, whether whether there's there is even such a thing as wilderness or whether the term is objectionable for various cultural and racial reasons or whether it's um, uh, metaphysically in, incoherent such that it relies on a, a human nature divide and there's no such binary. And then so this whole concern that maybe we shouldn't even be talking about wilderness. Um, yeah, I. <laughs> I felt like the first thing to do was was try and try and show that there was a coherent and um, uh, and, and in some ways commonsensical way to to speak about wilderness without being worried that we were bogged down in sort of endless linguistic and and conceptual difficulties. Yeah. Yeah, and I know some people also make the distinction between wilderness and wildness, and they try and let that do some work for them. And uh, but especially I think of like Bill McKibben, it must have been around 1990, you know, and he's like, all right, the end of nature. And yeah. so there's officially no more nature. We've, we've, you know, everything is so impacted by humans that the word has just lost all meaning. I'm like, yeah, but there's still a meaning to it. And uh, and the way you describe yeah. it, you know, it's a condition where there's a relatively low human influence or impact. Like, yeah, I think that still makes sense, even in the Anthropocene. Yeah, yeah. And and yeah, Mc McKibben said the end of nature, the way I talk about wilderness, it, it, he could have said the end of wilderness. We, we end up kind of using those terms s synonymously, but um, it's tricky when you make a statement like that, like there's there's no more nature left and then say, now let's go out there and preserve nature before they get rid of the rest of it. Well, wait a minute, <laughs> which is it? I, I, is it all gone? It's also, I mean, to me, I'm, I'm completely comfortable acknowledging that it's a, it's a vague concept, um, you know, that it's that it's wilderness is like is like baldness. It's very hard to say exactly when it is that my, you know, rapidly receding hairline will qualify me as bald. You know, at some point, I guess it will. Um, I don't know that we need to get too hung up on that. I, I still think we can meaningfully talk about people who have full heads of hair and people who are bald while acknowledging that there are some some border concepts. And, um, you know, I have no trouble saying that um, the Alaskan wildlife refuge is, is wilderness to a greater degree than, than the Boston Common. And, and the Boston Common, though it doesn't really seem like wilderness, it's, it's, it's wilderness to a greater degree than the financial district, you know, or midtown um, man, Manhattan. So, uh, and and philosophers are used to working with with vague concepts. Um, you know, recently I feel like all, all we do is work with or, or discuss vague concepts like race and gender and, and and things like that. So the idea that there's not some absolutely 
uh, uh, binary firm firm distinction seems true. I just don't know why that's um, why that would be a reason to shy away from having co conversations um, about it, particularly when wilderness is also experiential. Like people have wilderness experiences and they have them in particular areas and they don't have them in other areas. Um, and I don't think it's terribly difficult to figure out why someone doesn't have a wilderness experience, um, <laughs> you know, in midtown Manhattan and, and, and they might, um, you know, in the Sierras. Like we, I don't think we need to puzzle ourselves silly <laughs> over why that is. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good one. I know, you know, um, I teach uh, at the University of San Francisco and of course San Francisco, not exactly the wilderness, but then there's some parks. And so for some students, you know, they're able to go into like Golden Gate Park or something. It's a pretty good sized park, entirely anthropogenic landscape. It used to just be windswept dunes. And then somebody built a pretty uh, a green park there. And, and for some people, that's enough to trigger something like a wilderness experience. If relative to that, they're just deep in the city, the concrete jungle. And of course, that's not as wild as like the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. But for them, it's like, yeah, but I'm still having some of that experience. And so we can Absolutely. let that count without needing that thin, rigid line between wild or not wild. Uh, yeah, the baldness example yeah. is fantastic. And that's one yeah, too. Where people are like, oh, I'm balding. And you're like, look, you got two hairs left on <laughs> your head. You're yeah, bald. yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, and Dale Jameson made a, made a good point sort of in response to McKibben. And I really enjoyed McKibben's book. This is not... Um, this is not meant to be a, a, a criticism of him, but but philosophically, if we're going to talk about the end of nature, and McKibben talks about how our you know human fingerprints are on everything that you can go to the bottom of the ocean and pull up a soil sample, and you'll find little bits of carbon that came from a factory in Poland or something. Yeah, um, probably. Um, the universe is quite large. <laughs> it, it it turns out, and um, that's that's part of nature as as well. So it may be that on on this sphere. Um, there has been, uh, or, or human agency is in evidence everywhere or almost everywhere to varying degrees. Um, but th there's a whole lot of existence that um, does not yet uh, bear bear that imprint. So even if you want to push this into sort of interstellar wilderness <laughs> ethics, um, th there's a lot of existence that hasn't been conspicuously marked by human activity. That's a really good point. Yeah, it's a big universe. We're talking like a couple trillion galaxies or something <laughs> right. like that. And ours is just right. one of them. And even for our galaxy, like, yeah, we right. haven't really interacted a whole lot with Saturn. And yeah, so yeah. yeah, we're actually kind of kind of small in the grand scheme of things. So yeah, helpful to take that kind of cosmic perspective, yeah. lest we, you know, overestimate how strong and forceful and impactful we've been like, of course, you know, relative to the scale of the planet. Uh, but even then, the mantle and the core are still relatively intact. Uh, we're really mostly changing the surface. Uh, yeah. So yeah, that's I think that's helpful. Help, helps put things in perspective. Um, otherwise, it's easy to get very hopeless about these things. I mean, end of nature, it, it gets pretty apocalyptic. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and what was interesting to me was to find that there's uh, it's a heterodox group of group of people, but kind of a growing body of people who are sort of enthusiastic about getting human fingerprints on more things and not not out of some sort of craven materialist capitalist uh, desire to, to to wreck nature and club the last baby seal on YouTube or or something like that. Um, but just people who think, look, if 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 we can make these interventions, if we can augment nature or or use our agency to adjust nature in different ways, if it if it's not environmentally disastrous, if it benefits human beings, and if we can even find ways such that our interventions are amenable to the welfare of non-human creatures, why not? Like, let's do it. Let's go for it. Um, and, and that really then, I mean, for me, pushes the issue, which is if if all of those what ifs, what if, what ifs are are possible, you know, technologically, scientifically, politically, the only thing that will be lost in, in a world where we have that power, where we can we can intervene in nature to the nth degree, um, without making things worse for anyone, the only thing that will be lost will be wild nature, will, will be wilderness, 
And so then if you want to respond to that, that's where you really have to think about, well, what is the value of wellness? What would we actually be losing? Um, you know, when we're, when we have all human managed forests, but we're not heading for deforestation, it wouldn't really make sense to consider these wild forests anymore. So we won't have lost timber. We won't have lost a certain beetle species or anything like that. We'll, we'll keep all those instrumental things that we're trying to get out of it. What we won't have is a wild old growth forest. Um, yeah. 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 And that is such a big question. Like, well, why is it so important to have something that we didn't touch? Yeah. Like, well, what if we could touch it and everybody's happy, everything's flourishing and it's just like, well, but, but you touched it. And so it kind of, yeah. it ruined that there's a kind of, you know, wonder to the fact that it was organizing itself without us getting involved. And you're like, I'd rather see it be destroyed than to see it be uh, flourishing, but we had to intervene. Yeah. And, yeah, and this, uh, yeah. this is th this is where I, I think that religious understandings and religious thinking about wilderness and wild spaces starts to be helpful because there are pretty strong analogies to the way certain spaces and objects in religious traditions are understood. I mean, they're deliberately not utilitarian. And it's not like if they could bring in some consultancy and say, well, look, if we, if we, uh, fix the inner sanctum this way or you know if, if we um if we readjust the holy of holies um you can get a three percent better return on on what whatever you'd say no no that's that's not the point <laughs> it, it is something um that humans are not meant to touch that we're better off not touching uh we didn't create it we don't control it we um we honor it we observe it we have a kind of reference for it we are almost proud of our lack of understanding of it in, in a certain sense. And we're not, we're not striving for a deeper sort of scientific un understanding of it and having, having places or things like that um, is a life enhancing and perhaps culture or even species enhancing or value adding um reality that 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 people want to maintain and i think that's where a lot of arguments about wilderness start uh, where they lead to even if people aren't explicit about that because fr frequently environmental writers and environmentalists um s some are um you know parts of, of more traditional world religions but very frequently they're not but but whatever sort of numinous religious fix that they're looking for seems they they get it from the stand of a of old growth forest rather than the um you know the temple yeah and uh and of course you know it's a religion and ecology podcast so I always appreciate when people bring up religion and try not to force the issue but it's like <laughs> no it's in the book it's one of the things i, I really appreciated because sometimes people just doing environmental ethics easily leave religion out of out of their thinking and then there's a lot of environmental ethics that does engage it, uh, but I, yeah, I appreciate that you got into that because it seems like such a such a huge uh, issue and one that people are kind of allergic to because of its policy implications. They're like, oh no, I don't want to bring religion into the mix. That's you know, we want a separation of religion or political judgment. And you're like, yeah, but it's but it's there whether you like it or not. Yeah, and it was there from the beginning. Um, some some really excellent scholars did did some work on the drafting of the Wilderness Act um, in 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 the '60s and went back to the the debates and the public testimony. Um, and far from being sort of a religious or anti-religious or scientific or secular ecological, I mean, it is shot through with religion that this is this is God's land. And we as humans, um, uh, we, could, we can participate in it as sort of a Sabbath exercise. Um, but there is something reverential about, about something, about a piece of creation that was not created by us and has not been significantly augmented by us. And there was both you know, in, in looking at how these debates uh, went down and the testimony people were giving, there there was really a real fear 
about overstepping human bounds in in um, getting our fingerprints on everything, but also a real a real recognition that there's a value in preserving a part of the world that will not come under our dominion and using very religious language not not often um denominational language but but certainly theistic language yeah right yeah i think of people like wallace stegner kind of saying like oh losing wilderness is losing part of our own spirituality and that kind of thinking and and even the yeah. the term numinous it's that kind of sacred other and it's like well the other is not really other once you touch it too much and then you, yeah. you've, you've lost something pretty deep there yeah absolutely um going back to 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 the conflict between animal welfare and and wilderness preservation is also where i think religion becomes becomes insightful because i do think for someone who takes animal welfare seriously i do think there is a cogent compelling argument that would be something like this if and when it's possible for human beings to intervene in the natural world such that we can lessen or even eliminate the unnecessary suffering of non-human animals without causing some kind of ecological disaster the burden is on the person who thinks we shouldn't do that to explain why we shouldn't do that um especially if it if it at a certain point can be done at uh, little or no cost to ourselves. There's all sorts of practical objections. Well, who's gonna pay for it? And how are we gonna implement this? And how would we police it? Let's assume we've sorted those out um, in, in, in some way. Um, I do think, you know, where, where I come out in the book is I, I think the, um, the best way to understand the valuation of wilderness and the intrinsic value that it has is that it's fundamentally a kind of religious or a spiritual value. Some people attach to it, some people don't. Um, I do think, I think there is a cognitive aspect in that you could get people to understand certain things they'd understand and they would come to appreciate it more. I think there's an experiential aspect as well. Um, and it makes me a little uncomfortable saying that as someone who, who, who really likes analytic philosophy, but if you have not spent a good chunk of time alone in the wilderness, it's very hard to talk to someone about the bizarre sort of phenomenological experience of, of what that is uh, and, and the sort of meaning and value that, that can be derived for, for a person. Um, but if that's true, that value then necessarily involves the unremittent and often brutal suffering of endless, countless millions of, of sentient creatures. And it's been, for anyone who happened to think about this, I think it's been easy to dismiss for most of human history because what can we do about it? We, we can't even solve our own human problems, right? We can't even take care of food insecurity or homelessness or, or, or um, you know, uh, racial justice or things like that. Like, how are we gonna start helping the bunnies? You know, it's just never been something and it, and it might still be very, very low down on the list of priorities. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to acknowledge that, but it doesn't mean it's not a real problem. Um, and if we got to that point and uh, with technology and our understanding of ecology that we could start making interventions, then you have to think, okay, we've got the value of wilderness on the one hand, which is some sort of religio-spiritual value that only seems applicable to human beings and only certain human beings. And then we have the unbelievable suffering. Um, and I think religious traditions historically have, have been quite good at, at uh, or have been, have, have found it necessary to, to negotiate <laughs> di dilemmas like, like this. Um, and that's, that's where I end up go, going in the book is that if, if reverence for wilderness is really a kind of faith, then maybe that's the way it needs to be talked about. And that's the way it, it, it needs to be analyzed that um utilitarian calculations aren't really going to get get you the um the right understanding yeah yeah i think that's and you know and that's um 
I think as the book as a whole, I think does this really well, where it opens up those kind of dilemmas and questions without giving like a concrete answer as to like where, uh, what's, what's best. You're like, well, for these people, it's going to be this, for this perspective, this would make sense. And those are the arguments that need to be had. Uh, but I, I really appreciate that. It's such good food for thought because uh, it really forces you to, to examine that for yourself. Well, do I have that, you know, kind of religious or spiritual connection? Do I have that like wilderness faith? Uh, as you put it, you know, go, we're going from uh, wilderness ethics to wilderness faith. And, uh, and that's then people are like, well, if I don't have it, is it because I just didn't spend enough time in the wilderness? Maybe I should go out and see, go out and test it and see what comes up for me. Uh, and yeah, so and, it's, and, yeah. And, and how many, how many sort of ethical transgressions are you comfortable or, or are any of us comfortable accepting in the name of our faith? And, and this is, I, I end the book talking about Kierkegaard and that wasn't meant to, to, to be, um, uh, uniquely Christian or say that there needs to be a Christian interpretation of this. I just think his, his idea of the move from the ethical to the religious applies right. here yeah. really well. But if you, if you just take an ethical understanding of it, there's horrific, unnecessary, unchosen, non-beneficial suffering in wilderness. And let's see if we can get rid of it. If we can, if you do believe that religion, uh, or excuse me, if, if wilderness has, has some kind of religious value that that transcends the ethical we're in an awkward position and, and no one under this bed in Kierkegaard I mean yeah. no one I mean I've, I've appreciated Kierkegaard on, on religion because he's not one of those people who finds religion and then sleeps better at night he's one of those people <laughs> who finds religion yeah. and wakes up screaming <laughs> yeah. you know and that's um that, that's that's been, been been my own experience i do have my own religious tradition and religious convictions but it's not something that's brought me inner peace it's it's something that's brought me a lot of a lot of dread and uh and 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 concern um and 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 you really would have to think about is the is the the enjoyment or the the value of maintaining a condition predicated on ceaseless suffering, which clearly seems unethical based on, and you don't just have to be a utilitarian. We could cash this out in terms of rights, in terms of virtues. I mean, how, however you want. Um, and so you'll have to do, you'll have to do some sort of conceptual work to figure out how you're going to, to, um, to accept that. And, um, and perhaps like a kind of faith, make a movement that you don't fully understand. Um, yeah, but uh, you know, I um, I appreciate you pointing out that that the book raises a lot of dilemmas and doesn't necessarily resolve most of them or or any of them. Um, and uh, that's because I, I I don't have the answers to to most most of these questions. Um, I think I understand things a bit better now. I don't, for me, writing a book, is there something you didn't understand and you wanted to try to understand it? Yeah. So you so you write that book and that's a, a process of, of, of coming to understand. Um, what I'm kind of hoping is that someone, someone will read this and pick it up and be like, okay, I, I see what you've done and you've made this move, but here's what you missed. And now we can make, make that move and, um, and maybe provide some of some of the resolutions yeah well i think that's you know philosophy at its best it's not always about giving answers it's about kind of uh, deepening our understanding of the questions and that can then help us in those next phases and and figure out how to act and how to live but you got to open up those questions and understand the questions first and yeah and the book does it uh, very well when i first uh, saw it i was like oh another wilderness book Aren't there enough of these? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the yeah, there are. Oh, okay, this is fantastic, uh, and yeah. uh, just so clear and uh, and hashing all this out under 150 pages. I mean, it's just really great stuff. Um, so well, it was small. It was small font. I mean, it, it, <laughs> it, could, point, it could have really. been at least 200 if they had <laughs> if they had given point. me a slightly bigger font. That's true, and a little bigger <laughs> margins. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> But you know, but it's it's interesting to be to be honest. I've had um, some pretty vitriolic negative uh, feedback from the book, and that's fine. That that happens as well. You you put something out there in in the public sphere, and people are free to react to it how they want. Um, but it's 
it, it it has surprised me. And I think I, I do think it takes maybe a willingness to get past the introduction, at least, and certainly past chapter two. Chapter two, a lot of people, um, chapter two kind of presents this objection from welfare, just suggesting that there might be might be something really um really unethical about allowing um allowing wild systems to continue as they do and a lot of people um particularly environmentalists just just find that repellent um uh or or ecologically ignorant or something like that but um also get quite angry um about it so it you know it's been interesting different different people react in different ways Oh, hey, I think that's ultimately a good thing. Uh, otherwise, you know, you have books that people are like, oh, I had zero reaction, didn't really read it, didn't <laughs> care. And like, oh, it's better to have everybody angry than to have everybody just not paying attention. Right, right. Or well, that's also sometimes a sign that um, that people didn't understand it. So I, I have, or that people didn't didn't read it. That I, I yeah. when you get when you get strong reactions one way or the other, to me that is a sign that you've you've written something that people could latch onto. Um, I noticed this, uh, this sort of phenomenon in, in graduate school when, um, different colloquium speakers would come in and when a speaker would come in and just, it was just shot through with jargon and, um, speaking in a way that frankly, no one could understand it would end and there would be applause. And then during the Q and A, just, just nothing. And everyone would just sort of nod their assent, but that was just a sign that, that no one had a clue what this person was saying. Right. Then, you know, in a different week, they'd bring in a speaker who was who was very clear. I mean, you, you didn't need to be doing graduate school in philosophy to know what this person was talking about. And then there would be intense debate and people would be going after them and pushing them. And it wasn't a sign that people found this this person's work more objectionable. It was just they were like, OK, I get what you're saying. Now I've got something to say in, in, in response. So, yeah, really provoking some thought. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The uh, the philosopher. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh no, go on. I was just gonna say that the philosopher Timothy Williamson has a mm. has a nice line on this topic where uh, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but he says something like the the most courageous thing you can do is be as clear as possible. Like let other people understand what you're actually saying, because once you do that, you open yourself up to attack. That it's it's sort of it's sort of an old trope in academia. Is just yeah. if you don't want to be attacked, obfuscate. Yeah. use bizarre language and bizarre terminology and people will often people will think wow i'm too dumb to understand this i'm not even going to try to critique it yeah so I, I do think i am you know there's there's a lot of a lot of very successful prominent philosophers who i disagree with but i admire them and that they they made their points very clear yeah. such that someone like me is able to say hey i know what you're saying and i don't like it yeah. <laughs> but, I, but i appreciate the fact that you were so clear and direct about uh, about what it was you wanted to say yeah right yeah that takes such a humility and vulnerability to be like here's what i actually think i'm going to say it so that you can hear it and understand it right right that like an educated 12 year old would know yeah. <laughs> what's yeah. what's going on here yeah 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 i like that about the book it's something where i'm like oh yeah you could you know a high school student or an undergrad can can have this and have lots of discussions you could also give it to an advanced scholar who's deep in the field and they'll have a lot to say about it. Uh, so yeah, I really encourage people to pick it up and read it. I know um, I've, I enjoyed it and definitely planning on using it. Uh, I'll be teaching environmental ethics again soon and perfect kind of thing. It's like, oh, this will get people talking. This will get people thinking. Well, that's great to hear. Yeah, and if if, uh, if they start to come up with solutions to the, to the dilemmas, <laughs> please, please let me know. Um, in, in some ways, I'd like to... I would actually love to be shown that I was mistaken in a few of my analyses because I'm not I'm not thrilled with where the argument seems to lead. Um, and that's just speaking selfishly as someone who cares about and enjoys wilderness very much. Um, I feel like I've left things a bit shaky. Yeah, I mean, really speaking to the Kierkegaard point of <laughs> like, oh, I'm not really thrilled where this leads. <laughs> yeah. And like, yeah, oof, OK. That's that's yeah. a lot. I guess Abraham's going to kill his kid. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. But hey, here we go. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, perfect. Uh, well, good. I like the uh, shaky and uh, and uh, angsty way to end. <laughs> that's a perfect note to end on. And uh, so, geez, Josh, thank you so much. Uh, the book is Wilderness, Morality and Value. Check it out, folks. 
uh, and uh, and just thanks so much for a wonderful discussion. My background is philosophy, so this is, this is just such a treat for me. Sam, this was a pleasure. I, I really enjoyed it. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you. And, uh, and thanks to everybody for tuning in and uh, the watchers, the listeners. Uh, we'll be back with more conversations for you soon. In the meantime, take care and be well.